do a general introduction. Hello, uh, everybody. Welcome to our uh, AI for Social Impact seminar series. I'm Milin Tambe, director of uh, Circus, the Center for Research on Computation and Society, which hosts the seminar series on AI for Social Impact. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Tiffany Weinert. Uh, hopefully I've not butchered your name. I'll hand over the actual introduction to Herman. I just wanted to say that for folks who are interested in AI for social impact, uh, there's a, our seminar series. There's also other workshops, a set of rising star workshops that will also happen and other panels. So please stay tuned to our uh, Twitter feed and other uh, outlets where we have posted this information. So I'm going to hand this over to Herman. Thank you, Milan. Um, I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tiffany Fino. Before I continue, at the end of this introduction, I'm going to ask everyone to give a virtual applause if you are able. So you can show your applause on the webcam or share an applause Zoom reactions. Uh, Tiffany Fino, uh, MLS PhD is an Associate Dean for Faculty at the University of Michigan, or UM, School of Information. She is also a full professor at the School of Information, as well as the School of Public Health at UM. She's a founding faculty member of UM's Master of Health Informatics program, in which she was a former director. Tiffany Research focuses on community health informatics, or the use of information systems and services to improve, to improve the health of marginalized populations and reduce health disparities. She has over 75 published peer-reviewed paper and her research has garnered eight best paper awards in health informatics, human computer interaction and information science. Tiffany has held over 9.8 million US dollars in research funding as principal investigator with funding from agencies such as Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, PCORI, the National Science Foundation, NSF, Google Canadian Institute for Health Research, CIHR, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. She is an associate editor for the International Journal of Medical Informatics and on the editorial boards of the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association and Journal of the Association of Information Science and Technology. And with that, I'm inviting everyone to welcome Dr. Tiffany Fino to present her talk, Leveling Up, Developing Upstream Health Informatics Interventions to Reduce Health Disparities. Thank you, and thanks so, thanks so much, Herman, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. So before I get started, I wanted to share with you a few takeaways. So today I'm going to talk about a specific type of intervention that is especially important when addressing health disparities with informatics. That is what I call upstream interventions which is the focus on social, political, and economic and physical contexts in which health is produced and reproduced. In this talk, I will briefly outline the concept of and rationale for upstream interventions, but my primary focus today will be on the implications of attempting to address health and healthcare disparities upstream and outline key considerations that researchers working in this space should address. I will also outline how these considerations played out in three of my projects that I've deliberately chosen to focus on different types of disparities with different marginalized groups and targeting different upstream factors with the hope that this can help to inspire some of you to do work in this area. As a background to this presentation, it's important to understand how health disparities emerge. This figure presented here is an adapted version of the World Health Organization's model of health disparities that is further discussed in one of my papers. The critical things to note here are that the model begins on the right with the impact on, of disparities on health and well being, which is the downstream impact. But if we trace backwards, we see that this is shaped by micro or individual level factors uh, like biology and behaviors. 
which then have a mutual relationship with psychosocial factors like stressors and psychosocial resources like coping. In turn, these micro level factors are mutually influenced by mezzo or middle level of society level factors like living conditions, such as available resources, transit, collective IT access. And there's also the social and community networks, which are a middle mezzo level factor and the health system. I'll be discussing interventions targeting each of these mezzo level factors. Importantly, as the model moves left, we move to macro level factors that are connected to mezzo level factors. In this model, we see a range of marginalized social positions based on, for example, social class, gender, race, ethnicity, place of, re of residence, and sexual and gender identity. Moving left, we see that these marginalized social positions emerge from a process of social stratification and marginalization that produces these social hierarchies. These processes include stigma and discrimination, segregation, power, and prestige, for example. I will talk about one project that addresses stigma and discrimination today. And then moving to the far left, we see the socioeconomic and political context, which includes factors like policies, values, and governance. Taking this as a basis, I highlight that I have argued, as I've argued in private, prior work with colleagues, that health informatics interventions should move upstream because they do not necessarily require individual effort, behavior, or choice on the part of people and groups who experience health disparities. So when I say moving upstream, that's moving to the left on this diagram in the previous one I showed. This, when we focus upstream, this means that we're um, less likely to produce, so I'll ask people to mute, there's somebody on the phone, um, one sec, less one likely to on. produce intervention generated inequality. Um, so that's less likely when we move upstream. Furthermore, uh, upstream interventions are beneficial because they're more likely to reach large numbers since they don't re re rely upon individual patient or consumer agency for uptake. They also have the potential to target multiple health and healthcare outcomes at once. Now I'll move to talking about key considerations for research on upstream interventions. For the these new um, for those new to this area of work or new with with new projects. I suggest taking the following points into consideration. And I begin with where to start. So my first point to all of you is that collaboration is key. It is important that health disparity interventions take the perspectives of those who are marginalized into account. There's some um, echoing. And that we work on the problems um, that are important to these groups and those who serve them. Second, it's critical to consider the health or healthcare issue that's being addressed in a project. Here, it's important to become familiar with prior epidemiological and biomedical research on the issue. Also, I would point out that for many, if not most health conditions in the US, health disparities or healthcare disparities exist. And it is incumbent upon researchers to investigate this possibility in any project so that unintended consequences for health equity, which I and others have called intervention generated inequality can be anticipated and possibly addressed. And I've written some work on this as well. Third, it's important to think about who the marginalized group is that's experiencing the disparity and what drives their marginalization. I will talk more about this later in the talk. So in this, pro in this talk, I will draw from three examples from three projects. The first, Project 1, is called Developing a Stigma Reduction Intervention to Increase Uptake of HIV Testing Among Gay, Bisexual, and Other Men Who Have Sex with Men. Project 2 is called Enhancing the Cardiovascular Safety of Hemodialysis Care, a Cluster Randomized Comparative Effectiveness Trial, or Dialysafe for short. And the third is called Shared Mobility Systems to Address um, transportation barriers of underserved rural and urban communities. As shown in this slide, each of these projects has had active collaboration from multiple organizations, underscoring my first point, collaboration is key. Each of these projects involve community-based nonprofits. Project one also involves a public health unit. 
Projects two and three also involve healthcare organizations. Project two is a hemodialysis facility chain called Fresenius Kidney Care. And a federally qualified health center called Covenant Community Care is part of project three. These collaborations are multi-year and span multiple projects. I've been working with Unified HIV Health and Beyond since 2009, and it's gone through various iterations since then as an organization. I've been working with the National Kidney Foundation of Michigan, and then later the National Office since 2008. And I've been working with Joy Southfield Community Development Corporation since 2013. These long-term collaborations with in-depth engagement have been critical to the directions pursued in the work I've been discussing. And then as this slide shows for my second major point of where to start, each of these projects addresses different types of health disparities. Project one addresses disparities in new HIV infections. The second focuses on healthcare complications in a specific group. And the third focuses on differences in access to transportation, which include, uh, which in turn creates barriers to a host of health enhancing resources like healthcare and healthy food. Uh, the former of which I'll be focusing more on here. And then in these projects, if we look at which marginalized groups are affected, you can see that there are different ones for each project. In project one, it's gay, bisexual, queer, and other men who have sex with men who are listed more generally here as LGBTQ plus people. In project two, it's women um, who are also living with a chronic illness and often various related disabilities. And in project three, it is rural and urban residents, especially those living in these areas who have lower socioeconomic status based on income, wealth, and or education. So now I'm going to talk about the specific problem of identifying intervention targets in upstream informatics interventions. So identifying information targets is more challenging in upstream than in downstream interventions, as it is often more difficult to move beyond conceptualizing individual health behavior as the source of a disparity. To determine the intervention targets, we often need to research to help us identify the targets in uh, the health disparity model presented here again. And in this model, I just wanted to highlight that there are four blue uh, areas, light blue areas, bubbles, and then the box in macro level. And these show us in this model the types of targets we might consider. So the first on the left is influencing social hierarchies, which may involve disrupting processes of stratification mar marginalization, like addressing discrimination. The second, if you go down to the, uh, to the middle right um, in the bottom, we see differences in exposures. So we might aim to reduce exposures. And those might be environmental, psycho, psychosocial, biological, or combined, as when we're thinking about physical stress responses. Moving to the right, the third is decreasing vulnerability, which includes both vulnerability to health conditions and the vulnerabilities related to lower resource availability. And moving further to the right, the far right, we have preventing unequal consequences of ill health, which may be related to health or the socioeconomic position that someone occupies. So it's important when we're doing this kind of identification of treatment targets to ask ourselves what drives the disparity. Here, it's important to look at the correlates of the differential outcome. Looking for theoretical mediators is especially fruitful as they can help to explain a relationship as in this diagram between factor X and Y result. M here is the mediator. Next, we need to ask ourselves what correlates are modifiable. For example, someone's age is not a useful target for an intervention. And then for informatics in particular, we need to ask whether technology plays a role in the disparity. Is there a moderating effect based on technology use? Are there technologies, perhaps like algorithms, that are direct contributors to some process that contributes to inequality, for example? Next, it's important to identify who or what person or people or organization has agency over the problem or the production of that disparity. 
As is shown in this slide, as we move upstream, the people who are reached in an intervention might be people other than the individual with the disparate health outcome or disparate health behavior. It could include members of someone's personal networks. It could be local government or nonprofits or intervening in a setting and how that setting functions. It could include clinicians or electronic health records vendors, um, or it could include on the far right, far left, policymakers, media, or industries for a few examples. So we have a far larger range of possible targets when we think about who has agency around this problem. So as an example for identifying treatment targets, I'll talk first about my first, my study one. And this study was the one that focuses on stigma reduction to increase uptake of HIV testing amongst men who have sex with men. So just a bit of background on this disparity. So most HIV transmission occurs amongst people who are undiagnosed with HIV. So that's a critical public health issue. And because of the disparate nature of HIV, new, new HIV rates amongst men who have sex with men or MSM as I'll say in this, this talk, um, there are national goals to increase HIV testing among MSM. And the recommendations are to have a test every three to six months although the studies that have been done show that MSM typically do not meet this guideline. There has been prior work that's shown us that the correlates of HIV testing include individual level factors as well as network level factors, uh, but the relative role of each is unclear. And in some cases, it's important to do some local research where an intervention happens in order to understand what might be driving things locally. Thus, we conducted phase one, our phase one study, where we asked about what network and individual level factors are associated with HIV testing among young men who have sex with men. We focused in this case on men who are younger, so aged 18 to 24, uh, because this is a group that in particular has the highest level of disparities around HIV infections. So, we look here at a model which was used in this particular study. The paper is published in AIDS and Behavior um, that I'm referring to. So we look at different kinds of network characteristics uh, that might be related here. These are personal networks we're talking about. And then there are certain kinds of certain network functions or processes in social networks, which also have been shown to drive HIV testing decisions. And in this case, we're looking at social support and stigma that is perceived through social networks, measures of social influence, and then certain kinds of resources people might get through networks, as well as individual characteristics. And here we were looking at a series of regression models that had three different um, testing related um, outcomes that we were looking at. So we conducted a web survey with 194 MSM in the, this younger age group. It was conducted in southeastern Michigan. We conducted logistic regressions. And here I'm going to talk about the dependent variables for ever having an HIV test and had, a lot, had their last test in the past 12 months. So here we see that the, this is a younger sample, as we would expect. And uh, we did deliberately oversample uh, Black or African American individuals because that is uh, within this younger group, also a group that is disproportionately represented with new HIV infections. And as you can see here, the age spread, uh, we have folks who had um, typically had had at least a high school education, and we see that the majority identified as gay. So this is the results of the logistic regression model. And the key point here is to identify these are the significant factors uh, based on odds ratios that we're predicting having ever had an HIV test. And we see here that network, network mediated information acquisition, so getting information from social networks, significantly increased the odds of getting an HIV test, as was older age. Um, having substance use histories and also uh, feeling like you could find a um, friendly place to get an HIV test. And basically in this model, we see that 45% of the variance related to ever testing was related to um, 
uh, these factors that are presented here. And also that 13% of the variance uh, from here was related to uh, network level factors that information acquisition. And interesting here, looking at the recent testing uh, model, we see that uh, having social network members uh, about which someone could talk about HIV with, um, with, with people who you are socially similar with, so that is known to be related to uh, social influence, we see an increased odd, uh, odds of having an HIV test recently. But we also see that there are significantly reduced odds of having a recent HIV test uh, if there's greater perceived stigma in a social network. And then we also see there's an effect for age in viewing HIV as, um, as something that is uh, social responsibility. That's the attitude to testing. And here we see 37% of the variance explained and 26% of that variance was attributable to network level factors. So we found that in this study that the following network level factors were associated with HIV testing behavior. Uh, network homophily, acquiring information from social networks and perceived stigma in those networks. And we saw that the network level factors accounted for 13 to 26% of the variance in the models. And in fact, in this model here for recent testing, we found that network level factors uh, were accounted for great greater amounts of the variance than individual level factors. So we see here a conclusion is that the net, net social networks and what's happening at that level is affecting HIV testing decisions amongst men who have sex with men. So this led us to an outstanding question of how these factors affect HIV testing behavior, which led us to phase two. So in phase two, we're specifically honing in on stigma as a upstream factor. And we rely on structural stigma theory, which is based on a substantial amount of work in the area of public health that looks at stigma as a fundamental cause of health disparities. And in particular, this theory argues that stigma is a multi-level social process that involves labeling differences between peoples, stereotyping based on those labels, separating into us and them, the loss of status amongst people who have those labels and stereotypes, and then discrimination. And these are co-occurring and mutually reinforcing pro processes. And the theory shows that function, this stigma functions at both institutional and interpersonal levels. So the research question that we posed here was how stigma affects HIV testing decisions whether and whether technology plays a role and what that role is. We conducted nine focus groups and a demographic survey and used grounded theory, but also drawed upon, uh, drew upon structural stigma theory as sensitizing concepts in our work. And in this particular study, uh, given our focus on structural stigma, it was important to consider this as a community network level factor. And so we, we included people in a wider range of ages and both HIV positive and negative people in the study. Of the sample most identified as gay, there were roughly equal members of African-American and white participants and more black participants were HIV positive reflecting the racial disparity in HIV rates. We also found this was a, uh, most, most of our folks had uh, education beyond high school and for the people with HIV, uh, fewer were employed or students than in the other group. As you can see, more were unemployed or disabled. Using our data, we developed a model that shows the perspectives of MSM concerning their role of stigma in their HIV testing decisions. Reflecting structural stigma theory and ultimately our health, health disparities model from earlier, the novel model presented here includes stigma's influence at multiple levels, the social process, institutional policies and practices, interpersonal stigma, individual psychosocial factors that are influenced by stigma like anticipated stigma or attitudes. And then we have individual testing decisions at the bottom. Given my goals here, I will, talk, I will talk specifically about the findings supporting the boxes shaded in light blue and gray. So the information technology industry, interpersonal communication and social influence. 
So in this community, it's important to note that with a lack of face-to-face -face venues like bars or bookstores, long-term depopulation in the Detroit area, and the lack of a gayborhood or gay neighborhood, the internet was seen as the major connector for gay, bi, queer, and other men who have sex with men. Social media, including dating and hookup apps, were thus the critical infrastructure underlying experiences of social and community networks. And you can see quotes here that are talking about that. Also, technology was important for both meeting new people, such as on dating sites or other social media sites like Meetup, as well as for interacting with known people. And as the second quote shows, this included facilitating interactions between members of the ballroom community, uh, which is like that. If you've ever watched the TV show Pose, uh, there's a community like that in Detroit. And this was a, Facebook was a vital resource for this community. But also social media, especially dating sites, were a major source and site of stigma. This is both where people talked about HIV more and where they interacted with one another, interacted with one another for dating and friendships. As the second quote here shows, people felt that these sites were promoting cleavages in community networks and undermining larger cohesion through stigma mechanisms. So we found here that with the social process of stigma, social media was a major site. So one factor is labeling. And you can see here that there's a lot of labeling as negative or positive or on prep or on treatment. And this is something that is, uh, in some cases, there's certain forms of labeling required to participate in social media sites. We also saw that there's efforts to social distance or group in us and them. And folks talked about when they were initially just interacting with people online on these sites, often the first question that came up was, are you positive when that became a way of trying to enact separation? We also saw that folks were concerned about status loss and perceived desirability in these environments, especially uh, with stigma potentially uh, playing out in the context of needing to self-identify on a profile or uh, being known as HIV positive in a more general sense. We also saw that social media sites were places in which people were experiencing discrimination, including uh, actually this, uh, the second quote here under discrimination and rejection is somebody who talks about actively discriminating against HIV positive people on uh, social media sites. And then we also saw uh, in the second quote here, somebody talking about very negative language and comments happening on Facebook. And then we also saw in looking at interpersonal communication, people talked a lot about witnessing stigma on these various sites, and then also uh, resisting it in various ways, for example, pushing back in conversations. So these particular sites became important sites of interpersonal communication, which are then shaped people's thoughts and feelings about HIV um, and the possibility of becoming positive, which then affected uh, HIV testing decisions. But we also saw that HIV uh, testing was promoted in a sense by being able to present oneself as having tested on these sites and being able to forward a kind of responsible person identity. And we found that nonprofit organizations were deliberately um, trying to share those kinds of uh, uh, framings of HIV testing through, for, through various kinds of campaigns, for example, but also uh, that people took it on within their own profiles. So through this, we found that promoting HIV testing um, might happen by trying to reduce stigma and that we found that these particular uh, social media sites were a major site of stigma. And we did further work to broaden our focus to look at other health issues that are also stigmatized in different ways when considering the implications of these findings. And we compare this to other cases to inform future work. Um, we focus specifically on mental illness for a comparison factor to look at how stigma uh, plays out on social media and its impact on health seeking, um, help seeking, which is a particular kind of outcome which is very similar to HIV testing because both involve seeking out healthcare. So when we looked at the issue of how social media design choices might influence stigma, uh, we concluded that with this particular case around HIV testing, 
and HIV in general, as well as mental health as a comparative case, we see that different design decisions may amplify social media on these sites. These include labeling, so the use of categories to build identities and connections. Stereotyping is possibly more common. Uh, there's a theory related to this, related to de-individuation, which can happen when there are fewer cues in an online environment, which can then lead to greater reliance on stereotypes. We also see practices of separation that are facilitated by various forms of interacting online, like distancing via posts. Um, so uh, ignoring a post, for example, uh, blocking or things like that. And then we see that there's a kind of status that accumulates in social media environments with things like friend accumulation and post likes, um, which also we see, especially in places like Facebook around mental health. And then there are issues related to anonymity and inhibition that is reduced in that context and the more visible discrimination that many people spoke about seeing around HIV and online environments. So, this led us to try to focus on an intervention target. So all of this work helped us to identify targets that are identified here in red. So stigma and discrimination as the macro level factor, but looking at how it plays out in social and community networks, specifically with ICT and the process of social networks and how they work. And ultimately the target would be trying to look at differences in exposure. So trying to reduce the extent to which people experience stigma um, as a negative exposure that can result in less help seeking like HIV testing or seeking help with mental health. And our next step is that we're proposing interventions focused on social media reduction in, uh, through social media design, sorry, proposing interventions to, re to reduce stigma by design interventions on social media. <laughs> Our goal here is to identify how theories from offline stigma interventions focused on intergroup contact, shared identity, and activism uh, might be embodied in online design choices and to use experiments to test um, related to outcomes like social distancing. And here we see uh, some mock-ups of ideas about how these theories could be embodied through social media design. Okay, so next topic is looking at um, choosing and translating interventions. So this is another key consideration uh, for anybody who's doing work on health disparities and health informatics. And a key question here is to try to think about what other interventions are there. And as hinted at by what I've just presented, uh, looking at the different kinds of interventions um, that exist um, can be very helpful. So we need to ask ourselves what the targets are of existing interventions and whether they are upstream or perhaps multi-level, so individual plus something else like how an organization functions or a family functions. Um, we also need to look at our look at, especially in low resource contexts, who needs to do what for this intervention to be successful when we're evaluating existing interventions. So here's an example from one of my studies, what a dialysis patient needs to do. We also need to ask ourselves how they work and if they don't work, why not? And in particular, we need to, for more mature interventions, look at differential efficaciousness or effectiveness. So this has to do with an average treatment effect. Um, so as we might know, uh, there could be an intervention that is effective on average, but it actually works very different for, differently for different people as this particular diagram shows. So this average treatment effect includes how it works with different people, but the result might be quite different depending on who you are. So when we're selecting interventions, we might wanna be thinking about what works offline um, as well as things that are successful for other problems or in other contexts. Um, and this offline intervention is obviously something that we're looking at in the context of the stigma and social media project I just mentioned. Also, for when it comes to translating effective interventions into disparity contexts, I will suggest that it's often necessary to conduct research to adapt to that new context. So we might need to study things like 
the resources that are assumed uh, related to using an intervention or the skills assumed and their availability. We might need to look at constraints that, are, that emerge in this environment or existing practices with which we might need to integrate. So now an example about choosing and translating existing interventions. So this is study two. And here, this is the fo project focusing on dialysis care. So just briefly for people who might not know, um, in dialysis care, the machine acts like an artificial kidney. It removes patient's blood and fluid and filters it and puts the blood back in people's bodies. It's conducted in centers typically, like the photos just described here. And treatment is typically about 12 hours a week. And here is a patient talking about a very common complication in dialysis. Every and once in a while. Um, and it doesn't feel good. You feel a little sick to your stomach when it's coming on. And you may even feel like you're going to black out. Uh, and in fact, if you don't let someone know soon enough, you will black out. So what... Uh, Asanath here is talking about is intradialytic hypotension, which is low blood pressure during dialysis. So someone's blood pressure dropping below a certain threshold. And this actually happens uh, frighteningly common, commonly. It's 20% of hemodialysis sessions in the US. And it has very long-term consequences ranging from short-term symptoms to impacts on quality of life, hospitalizations, injury of the cardiovascular system and the uh, development of disease and mortality. But this is a modifiable, uh, so this is going back to the idea of correlates that are modifiable. So there are modifiable risk factors for IDH. So these include things on the left and those include rapid fluid removal, removing too much fluid in a session and the number and type of blood pressure medications a patient is taking but there are a whole bunch of things that are not modifiable, like um, somebody's underlying cardiovascular disease. So we developed a conceptual model for this project. This is one which is a comparative effectiveness trial, and it's going to have on the top uh, an intervention for healthcare providers, and on the bottom, an intervention for patients. And we're trying to influence psychosocial outcomes and behavioral outcomes, and then we're looking at clinical outcomes. The dark box here is uh, intradialytic hypotension, which is our primary outcome. So when we chose an intervention strategy here, we looked at a systematic review um, of systematic reviews of various patient safety strategies, since this is a safety problem. And so we found that there were systematic reviews showing that team training and checklists um, have uh, moderate to large effect sizes. So these seem to be appropriate interventions that we could try to use in this area. And also we looked at peer mentoring and there was um, in various peer-based interventions, which is something that our partner in the National Kidney Foundation offers. Um, and this showed a pooled small to moderate effect size for health behaviors. And in similar populations, it actually showed a moderate effect size. And in fact, two studies have shown greater benefits for women, uh, as well as African-Americans, which is um, also a disparity population in this area. So basically, by choosing this, we were choosing something that we believe will actually work even better in our disparity population, which is women who are more likely to experience intradialytic hypotension. So to develop this checklist, we went through a very detailed process of translation involving evidence review, a Delphi panel, uh, various rounds of interviews and design and the active involvement of uh, steering and advisory committees. And one of the things that we needed to pay a lot of attention to was integration into a workflow, uh, thinking about uptake so here we were looking at activity theory as a mechanism for doing that. And we produced a checklist-based intervention. And notably, this checklist focuses clinician attention on three factors that are more likely to occur in women that are disparity population. So that's symptoms, previous lower blood pressure, 
and the higher speed of fluid removal or ultrafiltration rate. And then when we looked at the peer mentoring intervention for translation, there was a need to try to understand how other interventions might work specifically for a dialysis population, which is quite different uh, because of demands that they experience in their lives and the disability that many of them face. So we were looking at how to identify um, design requirements for this population in order to uh, design this intervention, in particular to look at how uh, existing theories um, that uh, might be effective, uh, might work or their meaning in this particular population. And so in this work, we uh, use again a multi-stage method, including field work and semi-structured interviews, as well as uh, focus groups that involve participatory design sessions. Um, and here, as you can see, the population tended to be older um, and we had uh, kind of gender balance in one group and um, not so much in the other, uh, which is there are more men who have dialysis. Uh, so that is one of the reasons there. And we had a pretty good mix of white and African-American participants. And to kind of show you here what some of the interventions looked like, we developed our results looked like we developed uh, specific themes and mapped them onto different theoretical categories. So here, uh, one of the themes is to collapse distance between patients, peers, and care partners. And the design principle that resulted was to design for a depth of connection. And uh, specifically, as you can see the quote here, people really wanted to use video or text-based messaging in order to interact with other patients. We also saw a uh, wish to really be recognized and harness people's strength and character uh, based on how, how much they've been through. And we saw a real kind of priority around designing for positivity. Uh, we saw, for example, things like flower and garden motifs and a desire for bright colors to promote, promote positive emotional states. You can see there's a quote here about that. And we also saw linked to sociocognitive theory, uh, desire for an intervention that could help people make connections between the way their healthcare process happened and uh, their negative results. So their behavior and what is happening for them. And we developed a peer mentoring intervention that operationalized some of these, and you can see a bit of this. There's some patient stories to uh, show some of what patients were looking for around uh, understanding those connections, as well as some goals, um, using goal setting um, as a particular priority here that help people see connections uh, with between their own behavior and the kinds of dialysis sessions they have. And where this is going um, as the next step, we're in the process of starting up a pragmatic uh, cluster randomized control trial in 28 hemodialysis facilities. And we're going to have about 2,100 patients in this study. It's a pragmatic uh, study as well. So it's happening as routine care is undertaken. And uh, you can kind of see the timeline here. It's a 12 month uh, time period with baseline intervention and follow-up. And we're looking at intradialytic hypotension as our primary outcome. And I think one of the things that's critical here, as I mentioned earlier about heterogeneity of treatment effect, is that our planned analyses do involve um, heterogeneity of treatment effect analyses around gender, as well as other factors. And this is a study that's taking place nationally in four regions. So the last point that I wanted to make for folks who are thinking about doing uh, research on health disparities using informatics is to design what, for what I call the full implementation cycle. So this is a cycle that goes from efficacy. So when a trial is initially studied or when an intervention is initially studied in some kind of a trial, and then looking at when things are more widely available, inequality in access, uptake and adherence, as well as ultimately effectiveness. So this particular intervention cycle is from one of my papers that looks at how inequality can emerge and how we can see that there could, things could get worse from a baseline health inequality to an ultimate uh, greater health inequality due to an intervention. And so 
I'm suggesting here that uh, researchers should be looking at each of these stages and thinking very carefully about how to guard against uh, any kind of inequality that can emerge in the process. When we think about efficacy as that first step, we need to think about mechanisms of action. So I encourage people to think about whether to move further upstream or downstream. So where are we trying to approach this? And of course, this is while trying to keep the problem tractable, which can be harder the further upstream you go. Also, do we want to look at a targeted approach specifically for the marginalized group, which might involve something like adding resources or identifying and building on existing resources? Or do we want a more population-based approach that focuses on things like removing barriers? And that can include things like biases and technologies or people that might be removed or usability issues. And when we think about mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of action, we need to think about behavioral theories. And few behavioral theories really have been developed with marginalized groups, and that's a really important thing to think about. So I'm presenting here just two of the theories that we know of that are behavioral that have been identified in marginalized populations. Um, and the latter theory of positive deviance is really about finding people who are in similar circumstances, but those whose outcomes are better and trying to find out why those outcomes are better. But the lack of these particular theories is really why, uh, that re why I conducted that research that looked at um, trying to figure out the meaning of sociocognitive and social self-determination theory in dialysis patients. So then we need to ask ourselves questions about access, uptake, and adherence. So who can easily access the intervention? What resources and skills are needed? Who are the trusted organizations or people who could deliver or promote uptake? Uh, how short can the intervention be? Because things that require more people are more likely to be differentially abandoned. So, and the example here is the third study designing for the full implementation cycle. And I'm going to just briefly talk about this study, which focused on transportation in underserved urban and rural communities. And here, <clears throat> The problem we're trying to target is less access to transportation leads to less access to healthy resources. And uh, my colleagues um, have really investigated why real-time ride-sharing services like Uber have not worked for marginalized groups. Um, and so there's various reasons that that could happen in urban areas. Um, we can see things um, that happen there. Um, in our studies, we found things like financial limitations, lack of digital skills and racial discrimination. Uh, but also when we look at rural areas, we find that the financial model really assumes dense populations and short distances. So we conducted work in order to examine uh, transportation uh, models to try to look at uh, urban and rural areas that are underserved. Um, so we basically, our approach here was a targeted one to try to identify resources that are existing in an area and build upon them. Um, and to do that, we looked at what are people currently doing for transportation and what are the barriers and facilitators associated with them. Here we conducted work in Metro Detroit. And um, just to move forward here, we did a secondary analysis of our results and one of the things that uh, uh, from multiple studies and one of the things that we found was favors was a very, uh, very popular kind of model, especially for healthcare transportation. So when we looked at favors, we found that some of the facilitators were the fact that it was affordable, uh, as well as interpersonal caring relationships. And there are some quotes here from folks with chronic illnesses about that. But then we found barriers included interpersonal reciprocity. So uh, feeling like a burden to others and not, not feeling comfortable about trying to uh, doing things that burden certain people too much as well as difficulties with temporal matching because people have their own lives and schedules and things like that. So based on this, we proposed a new intervention, um, which is we've called a generalized favor-based intervention. And this really builds on that current practice of favors, um, but it's intended to be ICT support for individuals who want to volunteer rides or exchange 
rides with others as valuable resources. And the rationale for that was based on policy and design principles um, that emerged from this study. And as part of that, we've partnered um, with a time bank, and I, I'll, I can talk more about this model later if people like, uh, but time banks are nonprofits that help people exchange services with one another in a particular technology mediated context, um, as well as kind of a local community context. And so based, so we looked at this in the context then of rural areas, and I will move ahead, but we conducted interviews with people in rural areas. And here we found that again, the facilitators included a certain kind of uh, white reciprocity, as well as having a support network nearby. Uh, but also we again saw issues related to uh, temporal matching, and then there were problems around uh, that reciprocity could be attention. So generally speaking, we are then now moving forward with looking at a generalized favor based model with partnership with a time bank. And we're going to be building this technology to really uh, integrate with the Our World Time Bank platform, a technology they already use, and we'll be moving towards a pilot field deployment. And currently we're conducting design sessions, uh, participatory design sessions in these areas. So just to get to end now, I'll continue uh, wrap up with my takeaways. So I've argued here that there are key considerations for people who are conducting upstream health informatics research. I talked about where to start, including the point that collaboration is key. I've talked about identifying intervention targets and I discussed the stigma related intervention as an example of uh, extended work to look at intervention targets, especially using technology. I've then talked about choosing and translating existing interventions. Um, in particular, here we, this was the project related to hemodialysis care and extensive work to try to translate behavior change theory in the context of a patient-based intervention for dialysis patients uh, using peer mentoring, as well as checklists um, in a dialysis context. And then I've talked about designing for the full implementation cycle. And here I talked about a transportation project where we really focused on trying to build on existing resources that exist in the community and to try to think through what the barriers and facilitators were to, to broader um, impact of those practices that were really working. And we've partnered with a time bank in order to try to develop an intervention for broader reach and taking a favor-based model and making it more generalized through a generalized exchange. So thank you very much. Um, there is a lot to cover, um, but hopefully this will inspire some of you to try to do similar work and help you think through some of the steps you might take. And I have some acknowledgements to make with respect to funding and community and clinical partners and co-investigators, as well as PhD students and postdoctoral fellows and various students and staff who've worked on this work. And if you want to get in touch with me, um, this is how to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany, for sharing your research. I'm going to start taking questions. And the first question is from Milan. Milan, do you wanna unmute and ask your question quickly? It's not, it's not unmuting. All right, so uh, Tiffany, thank you. Very interesting and very relevant to us. And um, apologies for uh, previously butchering your last name. Um, no worries. We have uh, worked on AI-enabled social interventions to reduce HIV risk behaviors uh, among youth experiencing homelessness. And what you've pointed out here is very interesting because you're asking to go upstream to kind of identify other factors, in this case, stigma. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of thinking about it, is it reasonable to think about this as a trade-off whereby the upstream interventions may be more difficult, uh, but maybe more effective because perhaps they go to some kind of a basic cause 
whereas the downstream mm -hmm. interventions are simpler to implement, but perhaps are not as effective. I guess I just wanted to get your thoughts on the trade-offs mm -hmm. there. And, and because it seems like there are many points where one could potentially intervene and figuring out the right might, point might not be a very easy task. Yes, I, I think that's a great way of framing how one of my key messages here is that sometimes there is that trade-off and it is often easier to intervene downstream than upstream. Um, and but one thing I will mention is that there is in the public health field a, a tradition of multi-level interventions, which might simultaneously try to address an upstream factor while supporting uh, behavior change, especially amongst those people who are motivated to do so. So or try to get people to be more motivated. So um, one of the issues with the downstream interventions almost always is differential uptake. So people who are in, you know, in their associated people who are more marginalized, uptake is often lower. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. We have a quick question from Rainy. Um, Rainy, do you want to unmute and ask your question or you want me to ask the question? Here, it's not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So I, I okay, now I'm gonna turn this off. Something's wrong with my computer, sorry. I'll type it. So the question hey, was, okay, go ahead. Herman, are um, you frozen? Okay, go no, ahead. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm okay, just, okay. Um, and the, uh, before I read the question, uh, I just want to announce the next speaker for the, the next week's seminar, which is Gus Farney. Um, uh, he's going to talk about lessons from bottom of the pyramid innovation for AI, so for social care. So, if you join us next week, um, uh, please join us. <laughs> and the, the, the question from Rainy was, uh, where was that question? Is there a way to manage discrimination from the first step and whether that would help? I think that's a great question. And if we think about discrimination as often being related to a form of stigma, I would suggest that actually, if we take it all the way back to the beginning of the social process, it's actually the process of labeling um, that is going to be the most powerful way to start to address discrimination from the very beginning. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, Tiffany for sharing your work and for everyone who joined the talk today. Um, I just want to like remind everyone again that the next seminar is on March 29th, with Dr. Chris Farney from IBM. And um, let's give a round of applause for Tiffany. Thank you. I am available to stay online a little bit longer if people would like to ask questions. So I can just offer that up. All right. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Yeah. Thank um, you all. <laughs> Yeah, Thank I you want so much. To... Yes, Herman, please go. Yeah, I want to expand the, the question from Rainy because um, uh, it's not the tension, but there's like there seem to be two options, right? You can address the, the challenges that are present right now, or you can address the root challenges, the the root the uh, the societal origin of health disparities. And um, Maybe you can like 